Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the church. I thank you for all the members here, everyone here who's joining us. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that brings us together. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy towards us and the answering of prayers. I thank you for answering our prayers toward Frank and Sabrina. I also ask that you be with our young people, Lord. I know that Satan is always trying to pull them to the path of corruption so that they can be unfitted for the work. And I just pray that your angels that excel in strength will help, will help, will help secure them and drive away the evil so that they will stand on your side. Lord, I also pray for different ministry opportunities that may come about, and I pray that it will be, it will have your blessing and that it will be what you want it to be. I thank you so much, Lord, for the time that we have to spend together. Please send us your Holy Spirit that we will understand your word and that it will be in our hearts so that we may serve you completely and full of love and reverence. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So we ended in chapter 10. Now we're in chapter 11. And as I told you, though, I believe that the, all the other chapters are sort of this buildup to chapter 11, because the whole argument that Paul has been making about why Jesus is greater, how he fulfills, um, how he fulfills the, uh, the, the order of Melchizedek, how he is a greater high priest, how he has joined himself to humanity, how he's greater than the angels, how he is equal with God the Father, all these things that Paul has been building up, it's all based on an understanding of the Old Testament. And, and then he goes further and he talks about how the sacrifice of Jesus supersede the sacrifices in the temple, the feasts and festivals, how Jesus is in fulfilling those, how there's a heavenly sanctuary. And all of this is based on the scriptures. And I told you that my take on why the people were willing to walk away was because everything that they had been talking about in the scriptures, nothing has happened. Jesus hasn't returned. Uh, the temple still stands. Uh, the, the relatives have humiliated them. They've heard things. Um, there's been divisions in the church between the, the Jews and the Gentiles. Um, it, it just is things aren't going the way that they had hoped. And so Paul has made this whole case of how you need to put your trust and faith in the word of God. And so now, after he's made this whole case, he, Hebrews 11 is a list of examples where he is going to show you how the just live by faith. A lot of times when we read in Romans uh, 117, or we read where here in Hebrews, where he has cited the just shall live by faith, uh, we have this sort of ethereal idea of what that means. We, we think, well, that's, 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 a, that's a warm fuzzy, that's that's a that's just a good feeling. That's just a, a some idea of assurance. It's it's maybe nice words to put on a calendar, but but Paul shows you practically, and this is this is what I love about Hebrews chapter eleven. All these people are real, and it shows you how they lived by faith in the situation that they were in, and not all of them live by faith in the same manner, but they all lived by it which means that their actions corresponded to their trusting in the promises of God. Paul has made the argument for 10 chapters that you need to trust in the word of God, trust in the promises of God. This is the way it has always been. Trust, trust, trust in God's word, his promises, all these things, his God's oath, trust in all of that. But here's the thing. God's oath, God's promises are just that the Hebrews have seen no fulfillment of it. But what Paul is going to show is that from the very inception of our faith, you have to trust in the promises of God. So here we go. This is how the just live by faith. And I love the very first thing. A lot of times when we talk about in the, in, in the idea of creation, uh, I, list, I was listening to a creationist say this, and I understood why he said it, but I disagreed with it. He said that creation isn't a salvation issue. And many would agree and say, well, it's not a salvation issue. But if you don't accept that God has created the earth 
it's six literal days and rested on the seventh, then how can you be so sure that the same person who created the earth through whom all things were created and by whom all of us exist, that same person who was then crucified and was resurrected from dead, what is more difficult? The, the creation of the earth in six literal days or that a man is beaten nearly to death, uh, uh, put on a cross, suffocates and dies, and then a spear is run through his side, and that man is resurrected from the dead, and through that man, all sin can be purged away. What is more difficult to believe? Or that the same man was able to turn water to wine, walk on the water, able to take five loaves and two fishes and multiply them to feed 4,000 people, that this man was able to touch someone who was a leper and, and heal them or touch someone who was born blind after anointing their eyes with clay and healing them and restoring them or take someone who was a paralytic for 38 years and restoring to them their ability to walk in health or someone whose hand had been severely crippled and could not move it and restored it as whole as the other one. I mean, just think about it. Where does it end? Where, where do you draw the scientific razor to say that can happen, but that can't happen? You can't. The Bible is a take it or leave it book. It says, here's the evidence, take it or leave it. But the Bible isn't going to change. The Bible doesn't say, oh, oh, well, but evolution came out. Well, we got to, we're going to have to make some changes. That's not what the Bible does. It doesn't. Yeah, I think as Adventists, it's so crazy because of all people, if we're giving the three angels message uh, to fear God who made heaven and earth and sea and the springs, we are actually confirming that in our message. And so it's so lame when you hear these, all these different theologians in our church right. explain, explaining it away. Right. It's, 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 it literally undermines the gospel. That's what it does. It undermines the gospel. It takes what Paul is telling his audience is to have implicit trust in the word of God, the promises of God. And then you say, well, you don't really have to have that. I mean, that's essentially Satan's argument. Did God really say, did God really say that? Did God really say that the earth was created in six literal days? And he rested on the seventh. Did he really say that? Or is it, does it mean something else? And that's Satan's thing. So notice what Paul starts off with right away. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, again, this is the idea that faith is a promise. You hope for it, but you don't realize it. You don't see it. And the very first example he uses, and so he says, for by it, the elder, elders obtain a good report. Notice the very first thing he says. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made, which are things are visible. Now, some of us here have getting up in age, but, and you can, and feel free to chime in, but I'm pretty sure I know the answer. Is anyone here, was anyone there when God created the heavens, the earth, and sea, right? I mean, was anyone there? Did they actually hear the word come from on high and watch the waters separate? From, from causing, creating the firmament and the dry land and the vegetation to spring up in the animals. No one here has seen that. And Paul understands that implicitly. That's why he says, by faith. We understand by faith because nobody saw it. It's, what is our faith in? The word of God, the very word of God. We trust in the promises that this is what God has done. And notice, why does he say this to his Hebrew audience? Why is Paul saying this to his Hebrew audience where this should be a give me? Why? Why do you think he's saying that? Anyone care to guess? Well, reaffirmation. Like, what well, reaffirmation, but there's something. So think about it, Manita. There's something that they did every week. Every week these Hebrews did because they were still in the synagogue. They were still with their families. They were raised Jewish. There's something that they did every week to testify to this creator that he actually rested after he, after he uh, created the earth in six literal days. Paul's essentially saying, by faith, when you're keeping the Sabbath, by faith, you affirm through your actions that God created the world. And the things which exist were framed by the word of God, which we do not see, or by, by what he said. Let's go on to verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, 
he being dead still speaks. Now, I love that he uses this as the second example, because not every time do we live by faith, it seemingly works out for us on this earth. I mean, think about it. Abel trusted God. He trusted God, and he did according to God's word. Did Cain obey God's word? No, he did not. There, there's evidence to suggest that that they had that this wasn't the first time they had ever seen a sacrifice, right? Do you think that they just woke up one day and they decided to make sacrifices? They never saw their father do it. Adam Clark suggests that this sacrifice was made on Friday evening as the sun was going down. He believes that the this the the language of the, the Hebrew language gives the idea that this was a regular recurring thing. And so he believes that this was connected to the Sabbath. So where would they have even gotten the idea of making a sacrifice, if not from their father, who most likely told them that you need to put a an lamb, an animal on here and make a sacrifice for sin and, and, for, and for future for hope, right? So Abel did as his father had taught him, as he explained to him that without the shedding of blood, there's no propitiation for sin. And Cain decided well, what have I done that was wrong? I don't need to do that. I'm just going to offer up the best that I have. I'm going to offer up what I think is good. This is what I think is good. And Abel says, well, I'm going to offer up what God requires. Notice the difference. Notice the difference between the two different faiths, right? One's faith is in himself, what he wants to do. And the other's faith is in what God wants him to do. It's kind of interesting. They both make a sacrifice. If it was truly, a lot of people go, well, that's works and faith. Well, guess what? They both offered a sacrifice. Both of them were going through actions, were doing something. Abel just didn't sit back, smile, maybe a tear rolled down his cheek, and he thought about the Messiah. No, he actually obeyed God's word and did what he asked. And Cain, not obeying God's word, made a counterfeit sacrifice thinking it would be good enough and he was angry that it wasn't and notice what happens abel did everything right god even paul even talks about his gifts being righteous and notice he was killed not every time when we do what is right is it going to work out in a way that we think it should and this is a lesson of that and this is a, a lesson to the hebrews saying hey guys it doesn't always work out the way you think, but you still have to live by faith. And he goes on, by faith, Enoch was translated so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God had translated him. For, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And he goes on, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe, notice this, must believe that he is. In other words, that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, I want you to understand something. We have limited information in the Bible about Enoch, and those who are interested about Enoch, uh, I recommend you can read Patriarchs and Prophets on it. I, I'm going to leave that to you, but I'm just going to stick to the evidence from the Bible, because I want you to see that many of these observations can be made from really thinking about this text. We are given limited information, but guess what? We are not told about Enoch. We are not told that for 300 years he lived in vision. We are not told that, that every day he was in some mystical, ecstatic experience where he was walking side by side with God. That's not what we are told. What we do have, the evidence was what we do have, is that he was a man of conviction. How do we know this? Because in Jude, we are told that Enoch, in his one, the one thing that is recorded from him, that he preached to the antediluvian world concerning their sins. And he says, behold, the Lord will come with 10,000s of his saints to execute judgment on all the ungodly for their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in ungodly way. And all the harsh things ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He was condemning the world before the flood. He was a man who lived and walked conscientiously with God, even though he wasn't taken up in vision every day, even though it wasn't like an angel came down and said, hey, I represent the Most High.
We lost you. Spies, God, that's. We're having uh, audio problems. I can hear you, Bonita. Anybody else? No, nobody can hear Tim, probably. Mm. I can hear you, girls. I will text Tim and let him know. Okay. All right, I texted them. We'll see what happens. Wow, you look a little beat up there, Frank. <laughs> What's that? You looked a little beat up. Pretty shy. Oh, all right. Well, you can just listen in. But I'm hanging in there. Okay. If we get him back. Oh, here we go. He's coming back, I think. If you're there, Tim, you're muted. All right, try it now, Tim. Can you hear me now? Now we can. Yeah, you got you just dropped off. Perfect. Yeah, I, I I don't know what happened. Where where did I leave off? Does anyone know? Um, you're only gone for about a minute. So. No. What what did I what Where was the last part? I, what was I talking about just before? So I talking about Enoch. Perfect. So with Enoch, with Enoch, the, if you if you look at the text, what we have available. He didn't walk with God in a vision or in some mysticism. It was a daily practical walk. And we know that his walk really began after his firstborn son, Methuselah, which clearly made an impact on him to want to walk closer and be more conscientious for God. We also know that he lived in a very corrupt generation and it bothered him. And we know this because of what he says, which is recorded in the book of Jude. He says, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints to execute judgment on all the ungodly for their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way and all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He says all that because he understood that God was going to punish sin, even though there was a generation of people who didn't believe that it would be. And because he had walked so closely with God that he has the testimony that he pleased him, but it wasn't like there was an angel that visited him every single day and, and said, attaboy, keep up the good work. No, he lived very much like we all have to live in a time of supreme corruption where the whole world had essentially turned its back on God. So we cannot think that it was just some sort of, well, that's just a one-off. No, he really lived a practical daily life. This is living by faith. And this is why he says, without faith, verse 6, it is impossible to please him. For he who, he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, I like this because notice it's not just those who seek him occasionally, those who kind of check in with him, but he says diligently seek him. This is, this is kind of what you see in the Gospels. The woman who had an issue of blood for 14 years, she didn't just send Jesus a, a, a letter in the mail and say, you know, I think it would be great if we got together sometime, or tried to send him a text message. She, after spending all of her money, she actually went to see him and seeing that it was a crowd around him, even though she wasn't, you know, buff and powerful and strong, she did everything she could 
to get to him. And she said, all I have to do is get to his garment. And she was moving. And every step she moved, she was pursuing Jesus by faith. And then when she got to the very last of her strength and the crowd was the thickest, she saw the hem of his garment reached out physically and through faith and received the healing that she needed. This is the idea that we must diligently seek Jesus. The, the man who was on the, on the cart, or I shouldn't say the cart, he was on the cot. And remember that they lowered him down through the opening of the roof. You have to imagine that he had to use every ounce of his persuasion to tell his friends that this was something that they needed to do. I mean, he couldn't move, so he cl clearly couldn't do it himself. And he probably, you have to imagine that he probably spent some time telling his friends how he needed to be there to be with Jesus and had to convince them because not everyone was like, oh, yeah, Jesus has got this. Remember, the, the Jesus in those days is not the Jesus that we have come to love and know today. In other words, his reputation did not precede him like it does now with the full glory of the New Testament. And so in convincing his friends, he, like I said, he must have used every ounce of persuasion and all he wanted was to be there and to have his sins forgiven because he knew he was going to die. That's all he wanted. That is pursuing God by faith. Is there a time that God pursues us? Yes. They, they often, they, some, some old pastors call the Holy Spirit the hound of heaven. The idea that, that the Holy Spirit brings conviction and, and stirs the heart so that we will be moved uh, to, to, to turn back towards God. That is absolutely true. But it's also absolutely true that we must diligently seek him. We must diligently follow him. That's a great, that's a great book, uh, Susan. So uh, this, this is a part of it. And again, a lot of times, this is something that we, when things get tough, we're like, well, it's just not working out. So it's not working out. You know, I, I still have to pay taxes. I, I still have to, you know, find ways to make ends meet with my pay and this and that, and people still get sick and this and that. So this whole, this whole following Jesus thing isn't working out like I thought. Well, that's not the point. The point is to continue to follow him, trusting that the Lord is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He goes on, by faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen. I love it. Not yet seen because it had never flooded in the earth. He looked like an absolute idiot in front of all the scientists and philosophers of his day. Noah, being divinely warned of things not seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Now, I just want you to understand something. I don't think that the antediluvians were so stupid that they didn't understand maritime technology or didn't know how to build boats. I'm pretty sure that they knew how to build boats, and I'm pretty sure they knew how to sail or whatever, whatever technology they had. I'm sure they knew how to do things like that. There, there were certainly rivers and lakes and seas. That was all there in their day. So I'm sure that those things were things that they understood. But the, the word translated ark in the, in the Hebrew means a box like a house. Noah basically built a giant houseboat on the land far away from the water without, without, a, without any way to steer it himself, uh, with, with, with not a rudder for him to turn, not a sail to direct him anywhere, just a giant house that was supposed to be a boat that was also supposed to house animals and people. This had to look like the dumbest Thing that anyone had ever done in the history of the earth at that time. He had to look like the biggest idiot. And on top of that, he began, just like probably Enoch did, to condemn that generation and say, look, if you don't turn around and repent, if you don't get in this boat, we're all going to be destroyed. And they laughed. And we know that their laughter, their jeers, their scorn were so effective that some who followed and heard Noah turned away. We know this. And others died before the flood, like Methuselah, those who translated like Enoch, believed, believed not ever having seen the flood. But Noah persisted. And what's fascinating about Noah is that he is the prototypical end-time character. 
What I mean is that if you look in, if you look in uh, Second Peter, if you look actually First and Second Peter, also in uh, Jude, uh, and you and you even Jesus mentions in the days of Noah. Noah is a prototypical character for like the end times, where there are few people that believe that the message seems like the dumbest thing on the planet. That no one really wants to accept that. There's all kinds of resistance. And yet you're condemning the sins, the popular sins of the world, saying that unless you get into the ark, you cannot be saved. Very similar. But how does he do it? He didn't see the flood. He didn't understand that the waters would break out from the earth and, and smash the firmament and call, cause water to fall from the sky. He didn't understand that. He had no idea that that's how it was going to work out. But because God told him, he did what? He obeyed. He just shouldn't sit on a rock and say, you know, Lord, I really don't have to do anything because you're going to do it all for me. So I know you're going to send some angels and they're going to do the nailing. They're going to do all this. No, Noah sold all that he had and worked on that, probably had many splinters and, and many sore thumbs and many aching shoulders and back working on that thing day and night, preaching, enduring, and enduring the jeers, enduring the scorn. That's what he did. This is the idea. Notice every single step of this is living out faith practically. This is how the just live by faith. I heard that people helped them. They did. They did. And some okay. of them, some of them believed, some of them died, some of them turned their backs on them. But yes, they did. Okay. Yep. He goes on, verse eight. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place, which he would afterward receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Now, I love that Paul starts this here. And many of us, when we think of Abraham being the father of our faith, we think about him and Isaac. That's what we think and properly, right? But Paul starts it off here because this was the very first step of his journey with God. If Abraham doesn't take this first step, we know nothing about Abraham. There would have been someone else. We'd be talking about someone else. Tirzar, Melzar, who knows, who, who, whatever the name would have been. We don't know, but it wouldn't have been Abraham. Abraham was told to go, and he didn't know where he was going to end up. Imagine that you have such a relationship with God that he says, it's time for you to leave this place. And you go, okay, where am I going? West. That's it? West? Yep. West. Uh, what am I going to do? Nothing. You never don't hear anything. Uh, well, you know, how am I going to take care of, you know, those who want to come with me? Um, you know, how's it going to work out? You, silence. You hear nothing. And yet Abraham trusted in the promises of God that him who commanded him to go would find a way to provide for him as he went on his journey. We don't like to think about that because it's very practical and very uncomfortable. This shows that from the early outset that he had a very strong trust in God. Now, it, it waxed and waned, often like our own faith. There are times where we really do trust, and there are times where we really don't. But Abraham's faith ultimately conquered in the end. But notice that his faith led to action. He had to go. He couldn't just say, well, you know, guys, I, the Lord actually told me to leave this land, Ur of the Chaldees. And, and if, what's fascinating is if you ever have a chance, there's a, there's a great documentary. It's called The Fall of Civilizations. It, the, the, the guy is, is certainly doesn't believe in creation. But one of the fascinating civilizations that he covers is the civilization of Sumer. And Sumer was actually from where Abraham was. And they even talks about Ur. And he talks about what they believed. And he talks about the high attainment of civilization that Sumer had. Abraham was walking from a place where he could, he could thrive to go to a place in the wilderness somewhere where you, you what are you going to do? And so it's fascinating to think that God would call him away from that. And it's also interesting that Sumer or Ur was destroyed not too long after Abraham had left. And indeed, archaeologists will tell you that this civilization in Sumer was quite advanced for the time. So it's fascinating. Anyways, verse 9, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. 
For he waited for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now notice this. I, I love this because he was hoping, like he was told to leave, and he was hoping to come into that holy city. In, in the New Testament, it seems that it is always represented that Jesus is coming soon. And it's very clear to the writers of the New Testament, except for in some key places, that this is going to happen perhaps in their lifetime, right? That it's just, it's just what it seems. However, it doesn't. And Paul sort of alludes to that. It's not going to happen the way you think in 2 Thessalonians 2, where he lists some things that must be fulfilled first before Jesus appears. But even in Abraham's day, there was a longing desire that, man, this would be nice if we could wrap this up, that, that, that I could enter into a heavenly city that, that God himself has established, entering this, I, that I could dwell with him. And that was not to be. It's almost, it seems almost in every Christian age, there are hopes that we all have, whether it be in, in the movements between 18, 1833 to 1847, the hope that Jesus returned. Uh, they, they believe that Jesus would, they were hoped that Jesus would return in the days of the Reformation. That didn't happen. They had hoped that Jesus would return pretty much since after he died and that it hasn't happened. There's all sorts of promises that, that, that seem that, that they're not going to be fulfilled. And yet, in the waiting, in the patient, in the patient's prophecy is being fulfilled. But it's hard to see. And so even Abraham had hopes for things that were not fulfilled, yet he persisted in faith. Verse 11, by, by faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and she bore child when she was past age because she had judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him being as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky, in multitude innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. I, I love this one about Sarah and Abraham because she's right. I mean, he, he had lost all, a lot of his strength and vitality. She was no longer of childbearing years. There's, they basically received one as raised from the dead, their own son. And it, and it took a lot for them to finally trust God and say, let us live by faith in his promises. The, faith, the, the promise was that Sarah would have a son, not Hagar, not anyone else, but that Sarah. And even though it was past the time, and even though he was tired and he's thinking, well, how am I going to raise a son? I'm not going to have any energy. I'm going to be tired. Well, God doesn't see things the way that we see him. Abraham was given strength to continue many more years, even after Sarah had passed. And this is what I love right here. This is uh, this, this sort of theme right here from verses 13 through 16 is sort of repeated, uh, sort of repeated at towards the end of Hebrews 11. But what I like about it is why is Paul saying it? So let's read it. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. How were they assured of them? By the promises of God, embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare that they plainly seek a homeland. And truly, if they had been called to mind that country from which they had come out of, they would have had an opportunity to return. But now they desire, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So why do you think, why do you think he puts this in there, particularly to his audience? Why do you think he says this about them having died, all died in faith, not having received the promises? Why do you think he mentions that? Uh, I just love the part, the hope at the end, where it couldn't happen without all of us. So it's like um, a union, a sealed family, uh, you know, all believers of all ages. Yeah, well, this is the interesting part. So in the context of the book of Hebrews, in the context of the book of Hebrews, what was their issue? That the temple had stood, that the corruption that had, had existed, that Jesus had called out, that John had called out, had continued, that the lies about Jesus being resurrected from the dead still persisted, that 
the sacrifices and everything went on as it always had been. The difference is, is now that this Jesus has come and gone and nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. And he points out very clearly that many, that these, that Abraham, that Isaac, that Jacob, that Sarah, uh, they all died not having received the promises. They never entered to the, the, the city that they sought. They sought a heavenly city. They sought a city that whose builder and maker was God. They were looking for the Jerusalem that didn't exist. And they wandered around through the desert in the very promised land and not receiving the promises. And so here's the point is that even though they never received promises of what they had hoped for, they died still hoping. They didn't give up. They didn't give up when there was opportunity to do so. And then he points out this. He says this. He says, he says that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. In other words, they considered themselves not of this place because they sought a homeland. And if they had thought about the places that they had left, if Abraham had really considered it, said, yeah, you know, life was a lot easier in Ur, uh, you know, of, of Sumer and of the, the Chaldees. I, I, I could go back there. I could go back there and live my life. But no, he continued by faith to live in tents as a pilgrim, hoping one day to come upon the celestial city. That's what he hoped for. This is what he's saying. And Paul's argument to his people, Paul's argument to his people is that, look, not even the great patriarchs received the promises. Not even they. And if they didn't receive them and they continue in faith, why not you? Why not you continue in the faith? This is not our home. Not Faith Faith is the substance of what we hope for. It is our evidence of the things that we do not realize. That's what we have to go on. We trust in the promises, even if we die, not seeing them come to fruition. Amen. That's his point. That's why, it's, that's why it's difficult for us. Because I, I, you know, I know some of us have a stronger relationship with God than the others, but I, I, and maybe it will happen, but I don't know if any of us are going to be taken back in vision. We're going to see how the earth was formed the way God said it. And I don't know if any of us are going to be taken in vision and see what it's like when Jesus returns. What mostly is going to happen is that we're going to continue to trust in these promises and things are going to change as prophecy has foretold. And we may not be there standing when Jesus returns, but when we are laid to rest from the, from, from the time that we close our eyes before we, before we say goodbye, we're going to maintain our faith in the very promises of God, knowing that him who had made these promises and swore by an oath and shed his blood for us is faithful to complete them and fulfill them even when everything in our world and our senses tell us that it has not and will not happen. That is going to be our faith. And so now Paul goes back in and he starts off with Abraham again, and then he moves on through the patriarchs. We'll read through these. Hopefully we'll finish up Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said, and Isaac your seed shall be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Now, I love this because when God told him to offer up his son, he didn't say, yes, I can resurrect him from the dead. He didn't say that. He said he didn't say that. But but Abraham knew that, hey, if God said to me that through Isaac, that all nations, all through him, through that seed, all nations will be blessed, there's no way, unless, you know, my son is living in sin, there's no way that this promise can be terminated. God has said nothing about this promise being terminated. So even if my son were to die, God would have a backup plan. And that backup plan would most likely include a resurrection. God could do this. In other words, even death cannot steal away the promises of God. That's how strong Abraham's faith was. And that's why he received him figuratively raised from the dead. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of his sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on the top of his staff. 
By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instruction concerning his bones. This is a wonderful example. Did Joseph see, was, did Joseph see that they would be freed from the Egyptians? We have no evidence that Joseph saw that. Zero evidence. Joseph certainly could interpret dreams. Joseph certainly had a prophetic gift about him, but there's no evidence that he saw that. Why, where did he get the idea that God's people would be departing from Egypt? Well, he got that from the scriptures because Abraham was shown that God's people would be in Egypt and then that they would leave some 400 years later. He, he, and so Joseph, by faith, said, I, I'm not the one who's going to be living at this time. He died believing so strongly that he that 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 Israel would be freed that I'm sure that he had engraved on his tomb engraved on his tomb, probably in Egyptian, Hebrew, whatever there was so that everyone could understand Aramaic. That when, that when it's time to leave, you make sure you take my bones. And that had to be a massive testimony for years for years, because when, when Joseph died, the Hebrews who lived in Goshen were ascending in power. They had the best of the land. Everything looked good. Why would they ever want to leave? They were, they, they were prosperous. Their families were safe. They had plenty of food and abundance, wealth. They were doing quite well, and there would be no reason to leave. So when he says this on his dying day, He's reminding them about a promise that was made to Abraham that God's people would be in Egypt for roughly 400 years, and then they would leave. And so Joseph, not concerned about the prosperity, not concerned about how easy things had become in Goshen for his people, said, make sure you take my bones. And it had to be an incredible testimony when, when they were in the depths of slavery. Before Moses came, and they were in the depths of slavery. And I'm sure some people went by that tomb, which could not be touched. It was probably considered holy by both by the Egyptians, because it was probably given the imprimatur of the Pharaoh, whatever. I'm sure it was. That's why it was never defiled. That's why it stood. I'm sure that people walked by it and said, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if Joseph's right. I mean, there's no way. No way we're going to get out of this. No way, we're slaves now. There, there, there was a time that we could have left, but there's no way. There's no way. And then maybe when Moses returned, they went back and they said, hmm, maybe it's going to happen. Maybe it's going to happen. Again, Joseph never saw this, but by faith, he told them that his tomb and his bones would be an object lesson to posterity that you can trust you can count on the promises of God. There is not a scripture that is given in providential prophecy. There are conditional prophecies, but providential prophecy that is not going to be fulfilled. They are all going to be fulfilled. And he was right. And I'm sure when the person went to the tomb to get his bones, they probably wept. They probably wept that this man's testimony so many years before them, came to fruition, where they never could have seen it. They never could have seen how they would have been divinely delivered from the hand of their oppressor. Powerful. We just don't think about it, but this is what it means to live by faith, to trust in the promises of God. Verse 23, by faith, Moses, this is actually one of my favorites. This is actually one of my favorites because it is so practical. It is so practical. Uh, this is one of the most practical passages, I think, out of this Hebrews 11. Other ones, they're all powerful, but I, I love this one. It's very practical. These few verses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. In other words, even though there was a command saying you had to kill your son, they were like, no. We're going to trust in God. We don't know how it's going to work. We're going to make a, we're going to make, you know, a little thatched little basket and put some pitch in there. So it doesn't leak some mud. So, and we're going to do the best we can, but we don't know how it's going to work, but we just cannot obey the King because it's wrong. I love this because 
we live in a society today where we're told you have to do X, Y, and Z. Otherwise you cannot have a job. You cannot do monetary transactions, all this stuff. And we're going to have to learn to live by faith. We're going to have to learn to say, I'm sorry, King. I'm sorry, Mr. President. I'm sorry, Governor. I'm sorry, Senator. I'm sorry, whoever. I must live by faith. Take everything away from me, but I'm going to do what God has asked me to do in the most tough and trying times. That's what his family did. That's what his family did. They were slaves. They couldn't go hire a lawyer. They couldn't, they couldn't go get an audience with the king and say, you know, this is really bad policy. They couldn't hire an expert to go testify to the king about what this would do to the population and the labor force and economics. They couldn't do any of that. All they could do was the best that they could and hide their son. And of course, we know how that worked. But this is where I, this is the, the verses I was talking about where I think it's very practical. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin for it of a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked for a reward. Now, I, I love this because... You know, this, 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 we're like, yeah, okay, Moses, you know, no big deal. I, I don't, you know, none of us, none of us here are um, Saudi Arabian oil tycoons. If someone is, um, you know, let me know if you could just pay my student loans, that would be awesome. But uh, I don't think anyone here is a, a Saudi oil tycoon. I don't think anyone here is a Russian oligarch. Um, anyone here is a, uh, high Chinese communist uh, official who is a multi-billionaire. No one here is a um, tech giant where, you know, money just seems to rain from the sky on you. Uh, I don't, I don't think anyone here is in, in those, in those positions, but you have to realize that when you are in those positions, when you have, money that is unconscionable or influence and power that's unconscionable, you can do whatever you want, which is one of the reasons why we see the elites on TV, uh, how they flaunted the very rules that they told us to keep. They felt that they could do whatever they, they still feel that they can do whatever they want. <laughs> you know, in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, you know, if you're part of the royal family, those rules for the, everyone else don't really apply to you. Uh, you know, in, in Saudi Arabia, you can't have alcohol, prostitution is illegal, and gambling is illegal. But if you're a prince, and you have a yacht, you can go to Monaco, and you can get the prostitutes, you can get the alcohol, and you can go do the gambling, and no one will stop you. You can do whatever you want. And my point is this, is that Moses was in an environment that he could do whatever he wanted. If he thought a young woman was pretty, he could have her. If he wanted to buy something, he could do it. If he wanted the latest, greatest clothes, weapons, uh, entertainment, he could have it all. Everything was open to him. There wasn't a door in society that was closed to him. Every single pleasure in Egypt, which you can imagine, and many more which you cannot imagine, were all there for the taking. Moses had no inducement to go live, to be associated with his people whatsoever. He could engage in limitless pleasure because there was no, there was, there was no, uh, I don't know, finite amount of revenue in his bank account. He could do whatever he wanted, and he was associated with the royal family, so no one would stop him. Whatever his eyes desired, he could do. That's, that's a position that few, that none of us find ourselves in, but that is a temptation in of itself. Even David, who was a man after God's own heart, the power and corrupting influence of power was even so great on David that he began to act like kings of the nations around them. He's like, well, I like Bathsheba, so I'll take her. And I'm not going to let, you know, a scandal get in the way with her husband, so I'll have him killed. I get to do what I want because I'm king. And Moses could have had the very, Moses had the very same power. He could have done what he wanted to do. But Notice the passage here. Choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach 
of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. All you have to do is go to a museum, any museum, or you go online, you know, look at the Google images, and you're only going to see glimpses of what the riches of Egypt were. I'm sure that if we were transported back in time, it would be unfathomable to our eyes, the technological and advancements that they had made and how beautiful everything was. But Moses turned his back on that in the height of his youth, when passion rages strongest, he said, no, that's powerful. And if he can do it by faith, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, so can we by faith. Certainly we may not have that power, but there are things that come to us, things that try us. And we by faith, like Moses, like all these other men and women, can overcome. Anyways, uh, we'll get through this. Won't be much longer. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who uh, destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as, as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. Again, Moses, the whole plan of how... Uh, the deliverance of God's people was not unfolded to Moses. He was told to do this and he did it. And he wondered too, why things got worse for his people at times, but by faith, he continued to follow what God had said. And eventually deliverance happened. Moses didn't even know that God was going to part the Red Sea. He had no idea either, but he continued by patience and faith to trust in God and it was also the opportunity for God's people to learn to trust in him too and his promise. And again, by faith, all these things were accomplished because they trust in the promises of God. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the, har the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she was received, when she received the spies in peace with peace. Uh, and, I, and I like this. I like this because she had nothing. She, she had nothing to trust in except the word of these spies. She had nothing to trust in. They said to her, tie a scarlet cord in your window and you'll be okay. Everyone in that house will be okay. The guys who told her that didn't understand how God was going to deliver uh, the people of Jericho into the hands of the Hebrews. And neither did she understand how that was going to happen. And neither did she understand if these guys were completely trustworthy, but she felt that if they served the living God, then she can put her trust in their word, knowing that God certainly was going to take the city, even though she didn't know how. And so she would willingly put a scarlet cord. And I imagine when she told those who she thought she could trust, what her plan was, I'm sure that they laughed. I'm sure that when they saw, I imagine there were probably some family members or friends that when they saw the Hebrews had no siege engines, no, no visible means of smashing the walls, that they probably laughed so hard that they cried, thinking there's no way that they're going to knock down these walls. And when they watched them probably march around the city the first day in silence, initiating the march with a blow of a trumpet that they were probably like no way this is the dumbest thing ever what are they gonna what are they gonna just sound music and that's gonna lull us to sleep and they're gonna climb over these walls there's no way this is gonna happen but Rahab not deterred continued to believe and continued to say I put that that car that scarlet cord in there I know that I'm going to be protected and everyone in this house. And I'm sure she pleaded with friends and family members come and stay in my place, come and stay in my place. And I'm sure that they looked at the Hebrews and they looked at the walls and they said, well, I'm, I can do the math without certain siege engines. There's no way you're going to be able to knock down these walls. There's no way it's impossible. There's no way. And to side with you will eventually mean death from the king who will consider us all treasonous. He will figure it out and we'll all be killed. So to side with you will most certainly mean death 
when the Hebrews failed to take the city, and then you're going to be found out as a conspirator, and we're, everyone in the, your house is going to die. So no way am I going to trust in that. Doesn't And Tim, don't you think this has kind of an end time thing too? Because uh, I believe as we get closer, God's going to pick some pretty unlikely characters, like just at the end here. And sure. we should be open to listening when other people you know, are saying things. Because I can picture, as you said, all their cousins saying, well, I'm not going over to cut her house. You know, yeah. she's well, the prostitute in the family. Who's going to listen to, you know, who's going to listen to what she has to say. Right. And well, yet I, God was already doing a work there. Absolutely. Well, I think not only that, not only that, but she put her faith in the promises of a God who they didn't even know. Like they didn't even know they had heard what had happened. They had heard about what had happened in Egypt. They had heard how God had miraculously delivered them. They had heard how they uh, were able to defeat uh, some of the giants before crossing over. So they had heard that and that, that made them afraid, right? And so they, they had known something about it, but she bypassing all the rubbish said, I'm going to trust in that that is greater. And again, even though she was a, a prostitute, maybe even the head of a house of prostitution, she clearly had a change of heart realizing that this life that they that she had lived in Jericho and I think she had done very well for herself uh was hollow empty and she wanted something better and it looked stupid her faith looked stupid and this is where we're all going to be in the same boat your faith is going to look stupid before the world it's going to look absolutely stupid don't you think though that we've left the holy spirit out of it that uh the spirit was still working back then. Oh, and still, right. Absolutely. And so they, they just had the feeling because they put their trust in there that the spirit was working. Absolutely. Right. But it doesn't take away, it doesn't take away the, the outside influences, right? The spirit, the spirit works on our hearts and convicts us. She was convicted clearly by the Holy spirit, right? right no question. Right. But that didn't stop the noise of what everyone else was saying around her and how when she probably told them of her plan, how stupid it sounded to them, especially, like I said, when the Hebrews showed up without a siege engine. And they probably, like I said, they did the math. They looked at the walls. They looked at the provisions. They looked at their soldiers. And, and they said, I don't, this is ridiculous. And doing also the math, they realized that the, the eventually the king's going to find out that you are a traitor, Rahab, and everyone in your house will be killed, if not tortured brutally. They all did the math. And she was like, I don't care. I believe. And this is my point, is that faith is going to be coupled with action, but it will be a massive amount of doubt will be laid on you and there will be real consequences that seemingly hang over your head because you believe and are willing to act on it. That's my point here. And yes, yeah, being a rebel helps. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does help. And so and again, stubborn. yes, well, you have to have some of that stubbornness. You have to have some of where you say, look, I know what the Lord says. I mean, you have to imagine how stubborn she was. And you, you have to imagine how many times she heard you're nothing but a, a prostitute. Come on. What do you know? What do you know? You're nothing but a woman who has, who has done all kinds of things for money. That's what your whole life has been about. And all you care about is maybe moving on to something else. And, and, and she probably had to deal with all the insults, all the ignominy, all the shame, for especially those who she thought she could trust. But you know what? You know what never, never happened? She never took down that scarlet cord. She never did it. That cord went up in faith. And her faith didn't waver, even like I said, embarrassingly, when the Hebrews showed up with nothing but a bunch of priests leading some guys marching around with a with a with a wooden box with a white cloth over it, blowing trumpets occasionally and marching around the city like i said that had to look like the dumbest thing ever until the end of the week when they were like this is really eerie something's about to happen and then it finally did so anyways and this fits into basically the conclusion and what more shall i say 
For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, of Samson and Jephthah, and David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured. This is one of my favorites. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. That is a tough one. That is a tough one. That is faith. Still others had a trial of mocking and scourgings, and yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. They were tempted and slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, notice here's the kicker, verse 39. And this connected, like I said, with Hebrews 13 through 16. And all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. I love that made perfect apart from us because it tells you that there is a resurrection, a general resurrection. If they were to be made perfect apart from us means that they would already be heaven enjoying the celestial glory, but they are not. They haven't yet received the promise. And even he says that in Hebrews 13 through 16, which tells us that they haven't entered into that heavenly country. They are not there with the angels right now, sitting, sitting on the lap of Jesus, listening to stories. That's not what is happening. But it will happen that everyone who dies in faith will be united together. And as he says, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Those They're going to be surprised by how many years it's been. Right. The cool thing is, is that you won't know how many years it was when you're in the grave. It'll seem like <laughs> a moment. That's the cool part. But yes, it will be a surprise. I think there will be a lot of surprises. But again, this is the idea. Faith is our guarantee. And even though we can't taste it, we can't hold it. Because God has made these promises, we trust in them. And we are just like everyone else in the hall of faith who lived a practical life on this earth and had to make decisions, will I trust in the promises of God? Will I be like Hagar and be, and be made fun of and lampooned and humiliated for trusting in God over everything that I've known against science? I mean, the walls should not have fallen. You show me how those walls should have fallen by science. I don't think anyone has yet to figure out how to explain it. Yes, sound does destroy glass, but solid wall, hmm, that's not something that you can produce with a shofar. Uh, and again, every single step, whether it be the faith of like uh, um, Rahab, whether it be the faith like Moses, where you're surrounded by pleasure and you say, no, the reproach of Christ is more valuable to me than all the pleasures of sin, all the pleasures of sin that Egypt has to offer, or like Abraham where you simply go where God has called you, not knowing the end from the beginning. These are all very, very practical things that they did. Again, the, the, where the, the turning to flight, the armies, the armies of the aliens, uh, waxing valiant in flight, uh, receiving the dead, these are all wonderful promises in faith, but Paul actually puts the very practical ones out there for you. The very practical ones out there for you, because this is how we live day to day. This is why... His thesis that just shall live by faith is demonstrated here. And what you will see, it's not faith sitting in a chair, drinking, drinking a nice cool lemonade in a hot, sunny day. Faith is a daily thing, and it requires your response, your action, your willing to go through and endure. And this is clearly seen in verse 37. I love how it goes through the prophet Isaiah, who many believed was sawn in two. And then it says they wandered in about in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. This would be like the Lollards and, of course, the Waldenses, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Again, like the Waldenses, the Lollards in the Reformation time, that's what they did. And they never received the promise. They, many of the, the, the early reformers never even seen, never even got to see the light 
of the Reformation. All they could see was a monolithic power that would persecute you for merely having the wrong opinion and would have you, have, you, have you burned to death and hunted down like an animal. And that's all they can see. And yet they persisted in faith, trusting that God's word was true. And this is going to be the formula to the end of time. And it's going to be even more pronounced because your eyes will deceive you. Your ears will deceive you. And every sense that you have will deceive you. And you will only be able to withstand by holding on by God's promises, by faith. That's it. And this is why this book is so powerful. And I think, I guess the new quarterly starts, but, and then we'll have to pick up another book. But if, if we do have one more week, we'll go through Hebrews 12 and 13. Uh, we'll stop here. Any, any last comments or questions or anything? No, thank you. That was so wonderful. Line Great. by line, it's a beautiful yeah. scripture. Praise Your book Lord. is backwards, Susan. <laughs> oh, I turned it around. Was it upright the first time? No, no it's, it has been like that. Backwards. Oh. <laughs> I knew what it was, but that's because I got a mirror out and I was able to see it. <laughs> uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. So, that, so it's backwards for me now is the problem. Okay. Yeah, now I, I know it. It works for us, but you know what's fascinating is that when I um, when I found when I found out that my uh, wife at the time was pregnant with my daughter, I actually specifically read that and I read everything that was ever written about Enoch and the Spirit of Prophecy. And I, of course, I read mm. the Bible and all of that. And the reason why I did it is that I knew a bit of what she said about how when Methuselah was born, it gave him a greater conscientiousness towards God and a greater understanding of God's own love for humanity and the sacrifice that God would make in sending his own begotten son. And I, I, I read it because it, it dawned on me just how important fatherhood is in saving the man as Paul reciprocally, I shouldn't say reciprocally, but as he says that motherhood is so important in saving the woman and while it, it's not a it's not a shibboleth right it's if you if you don't become a father you won't be saved and if you don't become a mother mm -hmm. you won't be saved but how it was a part of his plan to bring us to a greater sensitivity of love compassion endurance if anyone has had a child the first thing you're confronted with is your own sense of irritation and selfishness that you could <laughs> you, you you could want to explode because a little human at about seven to eight pounds just isn't doing what you think they should be doing and you can't reason with them to do anything different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so Amen. I, I, you know, that book was very touching to me and it's one of the reasons why I, I memorized his, his, uh, the one thing that he was recorded as saying and everything because it was quite powerful. Yeah. I did not realize a friend of mine sent me this and, um, I didn't realize like I didn't <laughs> how much Ellen White goes over Enoch's life in the spirit of prophecy. It's, I didn't have a clue. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And then it also, it's, it's a, it connects a bit to the end times as, as what he said really spoke to the second coming of Christ and not to the deluge, you know, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints. Well, that's not what happened at the del deluge, but there was recompense for the evil that was going on on the earth. And so even he, didn't have perfect light on what was going to happen. He just preached that anyways by faith and he never saw it. He was taken away before that happened. Mm -hmm. Now he, of course he did see it in a sense because he could watch it living, but he had no idea while he was on the earth, that that's how it was going to go down. So mm. very powerful. And even and what I love is that you read in patriarchs and prophets that even the demons thought that this was going to be their end, especially with the way that the earth shook trembled and the fountains of the deep broke up and smashed everything. And again, think about it. You build a house that, that is supposed to be a boat without a way to turn it, without a way to navigate it. No way. And you're supposed to house all these animals and you build this all the way on dry land. And you just told them that, yes, God's going to protect us in this. And again, these people weren't idiots. They were like, look, man, we, we can build our own boats and we can put them in the water and we can sail them. We can steer them. We can make them better than that. That's a terrible design for a boat. Where'd you get that design? Well, God told me he gave me, ah, we're done with you. We're done with you. You're a fool. You're a fool. You're saying that this, everything that you're saying about your God 
well, God, they knew who he was. Everything you're saying about God and, and, and the reign and destruction is completely contrary to everything that has been going on for so long. So, you know, there's no reason to believe that anything in nature is going to change. These laws are fixed and immovable. So we're not going to listen to you. You're, you're, you're a fanatic. You're an idiot. We're, we're going to believe in science. That's what they did. That's what they did. And this, and this is, and we're in the same position today, except for it's harder for us to see because we have just as much faith in science as the unbelievers did in the science of their day in Noah's time. Mm. We have just as much implicit trust. And it's sad because eventually, and I think things have, things have sort of gotten us to question a little bit more, eventually the only thing that is going to make sense is standing on the word of God by faith. And you can't expect the wise men, the, the men lauded with degrees and talent to just endorse what you believe they're most likely aren't. And you need to be prepared for that. Just like Moses was prepared uh, to leave Pharaoh and follow after his own people because he didn't live as the rest of the Egyptians lived in pleasure and in luxury, even though he clearly could have. All right. I've talked long enough. I apologize. Um, any last words, anything before we go? We'll go and pray. Okay, let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for this night. Thank you for the study that we've had. Please be with us, Lord, as we rest and we awake tomorrow to go to church. Please continue to share your Holy Spirit on us that we would understand your word with deepness and conviction that we would apply it to our lives, that we would not be led astray. Please help us, Lord, to do your will. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. See you tomorrow. Yes, happy Sabbath. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.